Hello, and you're very welcome to this morning's signpost webinar. We hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. Today, we're going to be talking about soil health. Healthy soils are essential to achieving climate neutrality, growing healthy food, and are critical to reverse the bio biodiversity loss and safeguarding human health. And soil is being taken seriously by the EU, so much so that a new soil health law is being developed by the EU to protect our soils. And today we're delighted to be joined by doc Dr. Stefan Geisen, soil, ecologist re soil ecology research scientist with Wageningen University, who's going to be talking to us about managing soil health and the importance of soil biodiversity. Stefan, you're very welcome to our webinar. Uh, a second time. The last Thanks time you joined us was uh, less than successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even start, I think. So then it was... <laughs> yes. So, so those of you who joined us on a Thursday, I can't remember the date, but uh, we did have technical difficulties on that day. And unfortunately, it was the 16th of March, if I'm if I'm 16th of March. So we, we had to abandon the webinar uh, due to, to technical difficulties with Zoom. But Stefan, you're very kind to come back and uh, have a second attempt at uh, giving your presentation. And hopefully today uh, we will go glitch free. Pat, uh, good to see you again. Welcome along. And you're going to help us along with, uh, uh, with questions later on. So, uh, Stefan, maybe before we start into your presentation, if you could tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in Wageningen. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a soil biodiversity expert, I would say. Um, I'm working on all kinds of soil organisms. And, well, obviously, most of you are somehow working with soil, but not yeah, in the deep insights into soil. So I'm really trying to figure out what is in soil, but even more what these organisms are doing in terms of especially links to agriculture, to plant growth, eventually to even plant quality. And these are things I, yeah, I'm trying to continue to do. And we see more and more the, the tight link between plants and soil organisms and without soil bio biodiversity, yeah, plants wouldn't do that well. And yeah, that's a bit what I'm doing in a nutshell. So we need to broaden our our focus on on soil, our our, our measurement of soil health, really, don't we? I think so. So there's well, as as you said, Mark, there's this kind of big effort emphasis now on soil soil biodiversity at the EU level. Even there were um, soil biodiversity days or soil. Um, World Soil Day had a theme of biodiversity in it uh, two years ago, I think. Um, so people start to appreciate it. And it's not only earthworms, there's much more in soil. And yeah, we still are starting to understand it. And probably with knowing a bit more, we can probably know better how or if a soil is healthy and what to do to make it healthier. Whatever healthy is, I will go into that in a second. Great, great. Okay, well, if you could uh, share your slides with us, Stefan, and while you're doing that, just remind everybody that today's uh, webinar is being recorded and is available or will be shortly available on the Chagas YouTube channel, and the presentation will be available on the Chagas website. And if you're are not able to uh, find the time to, to watch the webinar, you can listen back to all of our webinars um, via the uh, Signpost series uh, podcast, which you'll find on most of uh, most podcast platforms. So, uh, Stefan, we'll hand over to you and uh, look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, so as you see, my focus will be on soil biodiversity. And you see here quite some examples of what soil biodiversity is and how it looks like. I will go into that in a second. But first of all, I want you to appreciate that these things can actually yeah, look quite cool. And even these kind of well, scorpion-like things that you see in the lower right-hand corner, they are not just somewhere in the tropics, but they are in our soils. Um, yeah. Well, you all know the importance of soil. I don't need to mention too much about this and many of the uh, UN um, development, sustainable development goals are linked directly or indirectly to soil, like, well, hunger, of course, poverty is linked to that. Um, soil is the major carbon um, pool, especially the tundra soil, but well, you all know, or most of you will know, that there are these kind of fur per mill initiatives to put a bit more carbon into agricultural soils as well. Um, yeah, and of course, life on land with biodiversity is a direct link to it. Um, but 
to know a bit more about soils, we need to define what soil health or soil quality is. And there are a lot of scientific studies on it. And honestly, I'm still not quite sure what a real healthy soil is. And it really depends on yeah, the people you ask, the, um, the background. So, well, it, it is a difficult topic, I think, what soil quality and soil health is. So just a few examples. So there are quite some um, efforts to figure out and define soil health because it should not be defined based on one metric, let's say yield or uh, carbon storage or whatsoever. But yeah, soil health is, is more than that. And it's a tricky one. But yeah, I'll leave that uh, open for discussion later on maybe. Um, because in the end, somehow researchers try to define it, but somehow we, we follow what is being wanted. And there's not just this kind of unique definition what a healthy soil is. And then we try to find indicators often for stuff Honestly uh, speaking, that uh, that's not really needed because if you, let's say, assume spend 500 euros to measure entire soil biodiversity to indicate that you have a lower pH, that would be nonsense. So um, health is, is something and indicators is something that we are working on and an, a good indicator should be better than something else and indicate actually something that is that you want to be indicated. Um, but now going into soil biodiversity. So we know that soil has a huge diversity. So, well, there are estimates between 25% up to even 50% of all biodiversity on Earth is in soil. And especially if you include bacteria, fungi, these microorganisms, they, which is often hard to define what a species is, but they are the most dominant uh, species in terms of abundance in terms of diversity, so even more than uh, insects. And if you see the biomass distribution on Earth um, that was measured in terms of carbon an organism contains, um, there was a study that suggested that most carbon, they estimated 450 gigatons of carbon, is stored in plants, followed by bacteria. And basically all bacteria are soil born. There's just a tiny fraction of this here, um, of this biomass that is um, marine or aquatic. And then you have other organisms like fungi, which are, yeah, I think 95% of this uh, biomass is in soil. Archaea, similarly, you have protists and animals. So animals, including us, we are just a quite um, yeah, a non-important part of this biomass. But going back to soils, so if you consider that these boxes here are basically all in soil and plants are virtually, well, half soil organism on average with their roots and they are totally dependent on the, um, the soil part, you know that basically, yeah, two thirds of all carbon or even more is uh, in soil, in organisms. And a bit zooming into the microbiome, I mentioned this already. Well, most of you heard of this importance of microbes, microbiome in our gut that can define our health. The same actually counts for soil. So, well, there are pests, of course. We all know these species um, that cause these plant diseases. A lot of fungi cause diseases, a lot of nematodes, which are yeah, you could consider microbial because they are quite small. They are animals, but well, let's let's treat them as as microbes here. Um, and also the omycetes, uh, Plasmodiophora, club root agent. There are thousands of examples of pathogenic bacteria, fungi, protists, and nematodes, or viruses. But actually, most that's just a minor fraction. Most organisms are, well, neutral or even mutualistic to plants. And well, of course, we all know um, rhizobia, they are uh, benefiting the legumes. They are the source of nitrogen in our uh, leguminoses. So there are a lot of known good guys or mycorrhizal fungi, but many are actually also quite positive, but indirectly by fighting off the pathogens, by 
um, promoting nutrient uptake and these kind of things. So many things are, or many microbes are, yeah, neutral or even positive, and the pathogenic ones are actually quite a minor part of this. And well, but there are more in soils that have direct links with us. So like there are human health um, promoting, but also a threatening agents. Um, so, well, name a function and basically it is performed in soil and by the soil microbiome. What is often forgotten is um, this kind of link. Well, this is an example that everyone knows. You have something big that eats something else. Trophic links, predator prey links, whatever you call it. So a lion eats a zebra. If we look at the microbiome in soil, what people usually look at is the links between plants and how that shapes the microbiome or the microbiome, how that then affects the plants or, or and how abiotic factors like pH, water affects the microbiome. So there we have a lot of knowledge, but actually this is something, well, we actually, we work on, right? So we manage the soil to change it in a way that is more beneficial in the end for our plant, partly via the microbes, by, uh, partly independent of the microbes by direct nutrient inputs. But yeah, th this aspect we manage, also the plants obviously in agriculture. What is not really considered as often that you also have predators in soil that shape this microbiome. So you have really small creatures like springtails. They, uh, if you have a flower pot, look underneath, usually they are, tiny dots jumping around. So these are springtails. You have nematodes. Actually, most nematodes in agricultural systems are, again, they are good guys. So it's not the ones that cause damage to potato, potato cyst nematodes or root node nematodes, but most are actually beneficial uh, by feeding on the microbiome and more details about this in a minute. And you have protists. And these are just the, the main predator groups. And first of all, yeah, if you consider these are protists, they are single-celled organisms, so super, super small, non-visible by the eye. But if you see the structures, I find them really, really exciting. So they can build complex shells. They can even build some fungal uh, fruiting body-like structures, but they are not fungi. Um, yeah, and amoeba are part of these. So uh, their morphological diversity is quite, quite amazing, I think. And they are just single-celled organisms. And then you have nematodes, which are just small worms. But also they are, well, their evolutionary history is, I think, about 500 million years old. So they are super diverse because in 500 million years, you can yeah, evolve quite a bit. But protis, so I already mentioned, because protis is a term that not everyone or very few actually might be familiar with. But amoeba, amoeba is something that most of you have heard. So these are these things, these little single celled organisms that somehow change their shape and can move in strange ways. And also like this one here, you see, uh, can fuse, can become, actually some of these can become quite big because, uh, well, their cell walls can fuse and then they become basically one cell. So they can become the biggest single celled organisms on earth. But you also have pathogens, obviously, like this one. This is looks like a worm, but it's actually um, well, quite quite a disease for us. That's the malaria-causing agent Plasmodium. That's a protist as well. It's not a bacterium, not a virus, not a fungus, but one of the other groups. And then you have this. I think many of you know this one. Um, it's the potato disease, Phytophthora, especially, well, there's a long history in Ireland about this. I don't need to mention more about this. So Phytophthora is also a protist, it's not a fungus. But if you consider eukaryotes, usually, so those are the things that have a nucleus, so some core in a cell, so that uh, differentiates eukaryotes from prokaryotes, which are bacteria and archaea. So here are just eukaryotes, and this is a phylogenetic tree with all the different groups. And usually eukaryotes is something we think of being big, like us 
animals, humans, whales, whatsoever. These are eukaryotes. Everyone is aware of this. Fungi are eukaryotes. So they can also become quite big often, right? And then you have plants. These are usually the eukaryotic groups we think of when, well, when we think of eukaryotes. But if you consider that these, which are here in boxes, are just such a tiny fraction of all eukaryotes, you can imagine how important or how big, how diverse protists are, because everything else is protists, which also shows you they are not one group that are just evolved from one ancestor, but they evolved in many, many, many different, different places, or actually we and uh, other things like plants, we evolved from protists, basically. So their diversity is enormous. About nematodes, one word. So here are different groups of sort animals again, protists, nematodes, springtails here as well, mites, and well, bigger ones, of course. So they are all different trophic levels. So they eat different sized organisms, let's call it. And here you have a nematode. Something about nematodes. So it's well known that nematodes are everywhere in the soil food web. So obviously for farmers, this year is, is the thing to focus on often. So we have these root feeding ones. They can cause enormous damage. And this is something we don't want. But then actually the dominant ones eat bacteria or the most abundant ones. They eat fungi. They can be predators. They even are, well, many of you will know these entomopathogenic nematodes that kill insects. They are even uh, yeah, produced and being on the market to fight off um, yeah, insects that you don't want in the field. So nematodes are known to be super diverse. And some of you might know this guy. Unfortunately, he died last year. But um, he said basically that if, well, just read it yourself. But he shows the importance of nematodes in terms of abundance. So in short, 80% of all animals are earthworms, uh, are nematodes, sorry. And they are, well, in all soils, but even in sediments. So they are just everywhere where there's some kind of substrate they can live in. And we actually did a study to estimate how many nematodes there are and where they are are most abundant, how the, the main drivers of nematode groups. And we found that actually most nematodes are not here in, in the tropics where most plant biodiversity is, for example, but they're in the tundra. So where you have a lot of carbon, where you have a lot of organic material, meaning also if you transfer this to agricultural systems, you promote your nematodes and in general, your soil biodiversity by putting carbon in. And these are dominated not by plant pathogenic ones, because they are driven mostly by a plant, by available substrate for them. But these are driven by carbon, and the most abundant ones are bacterial wars. Well, th this is just basic stuff, right? So that is not really relevant for health or for anything related to plant growth or so. So what about plants? If you have a plant and you add protists or nematodes, you get a bigger plant. So this plant here, we inoculated only with bacteria. When we added, in this case, it was protists, you get a much bigger plant, much more yield with lettuce in this case. And how can you explain this? So, well, in an easy scheme here, you have, let's assume a tomato plant, which, Roots are, sorry, one step too far. The roots are basically inhabited by a lot of different bacteria, fungi, directly inside or just outside. Uh, so there's, there are, well, millions of bacterial and fungal cells directly linked to the root because that's where the carbon is. Carbon is the limiting resource of microbes, and especially easy available carbon that comes from the plant directly. So these microbes are being eaten by protists and nematodes. Like this example you saw before, here are a lot of bacteria, these little black dots and behind much less. I show it again. So here are a lot more. And when these things feed over, they just consume bacteria. 
And what happens is the following. Nutrients, for example, nitrogen is released, ammonium especially, because, well, they respire, they have similar carbon and nitrogen ratios in their body, so they need to get rid of nitrogen. And that becomes available, available and plants grow. So it's actually a natural fertilizer that is already in your soils. And just something, um, a study we performed, So long story short, you see that, well, the soil biodiversity and soil health is not limited or is not um, induced by one group. So you need complex interactions. And in this study, we, well, we sequenced, we did molecular approaches to estimate the microbiome plus then protists. And our analysis suggests that the composition, so community structure of protists is the key thing that determines plant growth. And well, what you saw is we changed this protist community that is already there by certain fertilization practices. In this case, you saw this conventional organic and bioorganic fertilizer. So that was a collaboration with uh, some people in China and they use, um, but psyllus enriched and trichoderma enriched um, fertilizers, and somehow it does work. So they are plants do better than with conventional fertilizers. It's much more in terms of sustainability, it is, well, more sustainable. Um, and well, we get a feeling for the actual drivers of it. And protists are part of this. So the whole microbiome plays a role, but it's not diversity species richness or the amount of species, but it's really the composition of the organisms. Let's say less pathogenic, more beneficial ones, but with protists, it's not that easy. So it's not just easy to say, okay, you have less pathogens, so you have more yield. But it's, it's quite a complex thing that we're still working on because then you could even apply that. Um, so we were actually also interested in what does this diversity mean? Because you have also, well, for, for bacteria, you have thousands of species in a soil, in a gram of soil even. But even for protists, you have similarly many. And yeah, we did a study and was, well, because we're in the Netherlands, we had to work with cannabis. Um, I was actually a, a master thesis student that wanted to work with hemp. So fiber hemp afterwards. And then we said, okay, well, for us, plant is a model. And we just want to get some mechanistic insights into what biodiversity, in this case of these predators, mean. And in this case, we manipulated biodiversity and the amount of nitrogen fertilizer we added to see if a higher biodiversity of these protists can 
increased plant performance in a similar way, like the addition of nitrogen fertilizers. So, well, obviously this is something that we might discuss later. This is a very artificial system. So we got rid of everything in soil. So all biodiversity was killed. And then we inoculated it with quite a complex microbiome consisting of many fungi and many bacteria. And in the end, we measured plant biomass, but many more things, we are still analyzing this. So this is work in progress. But what we found is, so first of all, let me explain this one here. You see on this axis, you see the diversity level of these microbiome predators. And here you had zero protists, zero nematodes, five protists, one nematode, and up to 20 protists, four nematodes. And these were all basically bacteriovores or let's say microbivores. So they can eat for sure bacteria and maybe sometimes also fungi. And on this axis, you see plant biomass. And then um, these different green colors are different fertilizer levels. And yeah, what you see is within each diversity level, there is a bit of a random pattern. But what is very obvious, if you group these together, so the different kind of levels, you see a quite profound increase of plant biomass by the addition of protists already at a very low diversity. And that was really like yeah, 30%, 20-30% increase of biomass at low, um, low diversity levels. And well, there was no difference to high level ones. And actually, often low diversity ones benefited the plant biomass. Um, in a similar way than high nitrogen levels. So high light nitrogen levels without anything was here. So we're still analyzing this, but it suggests that just the addition of, well, protists and nematodes, independent of diversity in this case, but just the presence of those stimulates plant biomass in a similar way than uh, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer can do. And well, if that holds true, of course, we need to link it to the field, um, but we might be able to reduce the input of artificial fertilizers, especially by, well, either um, promoting the uh, microbiome predators that are already in soil or uh, by adding them. And actually, this is not just yeah, pure speculation. So I'm working with a small company that actually already has a product. So it's a Dutch company. They have one product and they're really keen on expanding this one, testing more because, well, they did try and error of just a few species and said, hey, it does work. You have more uh, or greener grass, you have more biomass production, and they add it to their organic uh, fertilizer. And yeah, so again, this, it's still work in progress, but there's potential to make soils, well, in this case, healthier because you might need less input and still keep yield more or less the same. That's a bit a complex one, but it captures pretty much everything I said today. So the plant is linked to many microbes in the soil and especially these predators can have a profound, well, often positive effect on the plant by feeding on the microbes by releasing nutrients, by uh, other things that I didn't go into, but they can distribute organisms, they can move them closer to the plant because, well, the bigger, the easier it is to travel. They can even induce secondary metabolite production. So there are many interactions and many links why these microbiome predators can play a role. So yeah. A bit, the vision is at the moment, we are often still here, we have a lot of impact. And this is linked usually to quite a low biodiversity in soil, but also in general, like insects and name it. Um, yeah, multifunctionality is some word I didn't introduce, but it's like the functioning of a system beyond just one function. So not only yield, not only carbon sequestration, but ideally you want, a system to have many functions at the same time. And of course, in an agricultural system, you want your yield to be highest, be more pronounced. But ideally, you also want some other function because then, yeah, you don't have leaching, you don't have 
uh, runoff and so on. These are all functions we have to consider in the long run. Um, usually pathogens in monocultures are high. You need then to manage. Um, then this kills, well, has adverse side effects like pollution or killing of insects or whatsoever. And that's then not as sustainable. And in the end, you might, yeah, you need more input in terms of costs. My vision is a bit, because these are all connected elements that basically, if we promote a bit soil biodiversity, we might actually in the end, lower our impact, our pathogen load and increase functioning and still keep the function up in terms of yield that we want. So we have a lot of data, right? And we are doing, well, scientists especially, we are doing a lot of experiments in different scales, very mechanistic up to field scale. Um, what is needed is that we actually link this all together to make more sense of this. Also, well, in this webinar, the, the, I, I really like this kind of idea to bridge between scientists and many other fields like end users, because this communication is often at least, well, in the Netherlands or Germany, it's not there. And this is, I think it's, it's something that has to be done because otherwise, yeah, well, we, we have some challenges upcoming. Like, well, I heard Ireland is also super dry, which is not regular. I, I've been to Chagas in the past and there was raining every day. That was nice. Um, but here, well, here also we have five weeks of sun now, not a single drop of rain. And that's not really, really nice. So we, we, we need some solutions for this. And yeah, well, I have a group of people that work on this in different aspects, going from well, disease suppressive soil. I didn't mention this one here with different aspects. We try different kind of agricultural practices, like see how intercropping, how crop rotations influence soil and how soils go feedback to plant growth, uh, to more fundamental work, also in natural systems about biodiversity, nematodes and so on. Yeah, so there's quite a high potential of microbiome predators, the microbiome in general. Um, yeah, both in terms of science, as you see, I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm focusing mostly on science, but I'm trying to get beyond and make things applicable by well, talking to companies, talking to farmers, and I hope that this can make a change in the near future. And yeah, with that, I want to thank you for listening. And I saw there are already quite some some questions I'm that's great to them. stefan thank you so much and uh, we, we'll get to those questions in a moment and, and pat will, will be helping us out with those and, and do everybody please uh, send your questions through and uh, stefan um you've, you've raised a lot of interesting issues there um i suppose our traditional view of of uh, soil health was looking at the chemical status uh and and maybe the, the trace element status but uh we, we really do need to broaden our our um our view of of, of soil health um or you talked not, about Mark, or not we we don't know so we are we're actually working on this because farmers at least in the netherlands they have to pay quite a bit for all these complex chemical analysis mm -hmm. my vision is that you can also do the same in an integrative way by focusing just for example on nematodes because you have hundreds of nematodes in your field and well, they all respond in a different way to different kind of things around them, to chemicals. So we might get some more, or, well, similarly valuable indicators, but more cost efficient and maybe even more informative. That's a bit also what, what we're trying to work on at the moment. So, well, maybe the chemical ones are sufficient, but well, obviously I think not, but yeah, we need, we need to test it. That was an interesting study that you shared, the, the video. Um, I don't think the sound was quite working on it, but uh, we could still yeah, read it. The, the sound is anyways annoying, so you can't miss too much. <laughs> the, the, um, you, were, you talked about the addition of bioorganic uh, fertilizers um, with, with, was it bacillus and, and other uh, biological additions, we'll call it. Um, is, is there a risk of you know, introducing alien species to, to soil here. We, we, we often hear about uh, the risk of importing alien species in terms of plants and, and animals, but uh, is there a risk there that you could actually 
interrupt or disturb the, the, the local ecosystems within the soil as a result of, of, of those additions. You're fully right. You actually want to disturb your system if it's anyways already disturbed, because otherwise you don't want to put something in, right? If it's a working system, you're, you're good. You only want to add something or change something if it's not working in the way you want. Um, but usually, let's say these bacillus species or so that are on the market, they are yeah, more or less ubiqu ubiquitously distributed. So um, the things that are allowed to be used at the moment uh, from an EU perspective are, I would say, quite safe because they are anyways in your soil in a low abundance. But if you shift the balance towards these, the good guys, that's how you make a change. So the organisms that are allowed are anyways already there. So also in terms of the protists we are using, you might have some kind of subspecies variation there, but they do more or less the same thing. They just eat bacteria. Mm -hmm. So the risk that you actually change the system in a non-sustainable way is very low here. And is the focus more on nitrogen or... Um... Uh, taking nitrogen from the air or like, I mean, we know that we, there are P and, P and K are tend to be uh, limited uh, within the soil. Um, do these, these micro uh, biome or bi bi biological additions, they release, help to release the existing uh, phosphorus and, and potassium within the soil? We don't know. Like, uh, I'm not aware of any studies that show anything about potassium, but um Phosphorus is being increased by the addition, for example, of protists and nematodes by interacting with the mycorrhiza there. So they release pressure from the mycorrhiza competitor. So they eat, well, they, they eat much better the smaller things. Mycorrhiza for a fungus is, is super thick. They don't like this. They are usually smaller. So they eat away the yeast, the bacteria, the small... Um, spores or fungi and thereby the mycorrhiza can benefit and gets more phosphorus and then the plant actually benefits so we, we we found this in some studies but well most studies have been on nitrogen because that's the most obvious link because yeah you have a similar cn ratio so if you eat you respire nitrogen you have to get rid of and that is a quite an obvious link and nitrogen is easy transported. So plants can more or less directly take it up. And phosphorus needs to be transported. And But that's being done then by, for example, mycorrhiza, if it's a bit further away from the plant. We, we have huge interest from our audience here by the, the numbers of questions coming through. But if I may indulge just in terms of the, the test, like typically in Ireland, uh, we will test a soil for uh, the, uh, the 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 chemical status and the pH and and some some sometimes the mineral status as well. What's what sort of soil tests are available to, or is there a soil a valid soil test available for assessing the the biological status of your soil or the, the biological health of your soil? Uh, that depends on the country. In the Netherlands, we don't have any. I don't know how it is in in Ireland. I know that South Africa has a test on bacterial diversity. That's well, that, that seems to be a standard practice. Um, yeah, well, they, they are small companies and they do their their thing, but it's not really standardized or so. Yeah. And partly, yeah, I don't trust in everything that is being on the market. Yeah. So there should be a bit more like guidance and because we, we still don't know if, mm. as you also see, like diversity per se is not really meaningful not yeah but it, it can be meaningful but it's more the composition that seems to matter yeah yeah so uh, the science needs to catch up with maybe what's what's out on the on the market there Pat, uh, so loads of questions coming in yeah, I think this uh, is a, uh, and uh, a lot of interest i suppose a, a good number of comments just uh thanking uh, uh you for raising the subject uh because it's uh i suppose a, a hidden subject a lot just right. to, Start with one, which is uh, I think is is probably a fairly key one. Uh, it just, just says thanks, Stefan, for the study. Uh, what are the conditions to enhance proteus in soil? I assume we have them naturally in soil, and what practices protect them, and what practices uh, actually kill them or or work against them? Yeah, it's, it's a very good one. Um, so in the end, they need food. 
right? And food is, it's not the basic resources, but the basic resources are supporting bacteria and fungi. So if you have carbon rich substrates, you enrich your bacteria, your fungi, and then the protists can do better. So at least what we see is with the organic fertilizers in many different studies, we show this now also um, straw additions um, that benefits the, the community, especially of protists. With bacteria, you don't see that much, partly or likely because it's just top-down predated then. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's kept in check, let's say, and by, by these higher trophic levels. So the, the protists, the nematodes that eat those and that thereby can, yeah, they, they shift. And the shift in this first trophic level is basically repressed. So you might just see the response of the bacteria and fungi in the protists and nematodes. So it's, it's not that the protists do everything. It's, it's really, I think it's the link between the whole soil food web that matters most. And it's visible at least mostly at the level of protists and nematodes. But as you can change protists and nematodes and you see well, greener grass, like the company says, um, they have a direct influence. There's a question there in terms of the use of, of uh, various types of, of, of pesticides and what impact they have been potentially having on the, the microbiome. And is it likely that if we can achieve a 50% reduction, that in itself will, will, will help the situation? That's a very good one. And while Ecotox tests partly use the ciliates already, uh, paramecium or so, um, as, as, as their response variable. But as you also see, this protist diversity is not just one ciliate, it's huge. So we can never get a cumulative knowledge on species specific responses. But of course, like glyphosate, for example, that inhibits some protists that do photosynthesis. And that is, that's an obvious one, right? So this kind of whole blockage of the amino acid pathway in the system is, is, is just there. So you will change also some of these protists. And if you don't have these phototrophs, so protists can also be phototrophic. So many algae are protists actually, then you also change your, your soil system, the top surface layer. And other things, while well, we also found that glyphosate has an effect, for example, on the on, on the protists direct on, on the predatory protists directly. Um, yeah, they for sure have a, have some kind of direct effect on some groups, and they change the community. And we don't know really in what way, um, because if you have a plant specific one, it has a strongest effect on the plant. But it for sure wouldn't harm the soil if you reduce it. And yeah, well, there's this discussion. I'm, I'm not sure if you can get rid of all the pesticides. That's a tricky one, right? So I'm, I'm having a garden there and well, my plants are being eaten and I hate this. So um, yeah, we need to be practical in some way, but a reduction for sure we can achieve by, well, making soils, for example, more healthy by uh, promoting the agents that suppress the diseases. And these are there. And well, sometimes we can bring them in, like with entomopathogenic nematodes. That's a clear example. Uh, we need something against slugs here. Well, not at the moment, but in general. That, but well, that's also biodiversity, so it should be good. Okay. The question here about the systems: uh, Do grassland or uh, arable systems promote uh, better biodiversity, if if you want, in in and better soil health? Yeah, well, there was just a study coming out yesterday, um, and we also had similar patterns that uh, the biodiversity of your bacteria is actually much lower in managed grasslands than even in, in agricultural fields, so in crop systems. Mm. Um, well, the green desert idea and so on, if you have a super highly managed grassland with only one grass species, that doesn't have to be better than uh, well, a well-managed field, right? Where you have a good rotation practice, where you have, I don't know, even like nice hedges or whatsoever. So um, it's a difficult question to answer. And even we see forests have much lower diversity, which in some way makes sense because you just have on average 
a more stable condition. You have very stable soil organisms. Well, you might go for mushroom hunting in autumn. Um, these things are just always there. So the changes are not happening that often. So the whole biodiversity is not prone to change, but it's a stable system. So again, like biodiversity is not necessarily always better when it's higher. That is something that we also scientists try to sell, but it's, I think that's wrong. But we need biodiversity in a certain fraction of biodiversity in different systems. The question there is, is there anything we can learn with an increased amount of our uh, food coming from hydrop hydroponic uh, systems? Is there anything we can learn from this uh, to bring into what I suppose is normally a more sterile environment in, in, in hydroponics? That's a good one, but I, I, I'm not sure. I've never worked directly, but I know a few people that worked in it and it's not sterile, I think, because you can't keep a system sterile. Like around us everywhere, you have spores, you have, uh, you have protists, you have stuff flying around you, you inhale the entire time. So if you have the system open for just a few seconds, you have stuff in there that grows. And um, I think, well, might be illusion, but I'm pretty optimistic that you can change a hydroponic system also in a way that is more, let's say, sustainable, that it's, well, repressing pests that come in. Um, so, for example, yeah, Fusarium is a common disease that occurs in hydroponic systems, I think, in some. And you might be able to suppress it by actually inoculating your systems. So, yeah, it's a simple system, but it's also, I, it, I guess it can be more complex than we think. There's some livestock farmers looking for some advice. What would be the, the, the top advice you would give to them in terms of uh, improving their soil biodiversity? Manage your plants. Uh, like especially for for dairy farms, well, with uh, problems with helminths or so, we are in, we are doing one study now where we try to get like a, what's it river plantain I think mm -hmm. in the system because it's a natural antihelminthic. So then you can reduce your um, your your antihelminthics by just having some natural um, components. You also have more well. Your grass diversity or your, your grassland diversity. I saw now some kind of farmers showing actually some, some insights at a, at a meeting with also some companies. And they said, hey, we actually get higher quality milk. We get more or less similar amount of milk. But yeah, it's, it's just the cows are more healthy or whatsoever. I don't know. I forgot the details. But, but just having not just uh, English ryegrass, but having more diverse um, plants to feed on. And there's a lot of work going on in that here in Ireland uh, around multi-species swords and a lot of adaptation or adoption of that by dairy farmers. So um, it, it looked very convincing to me. And by that, you promote biodiversity in soil because all plants have a bit of specific microbiome requirements. Uh, I suppose there's a, a couple of questions in here uh, relating to the relationship between higher levels of organic matter in soils and, and uh, improvements in, in the biome. Is it a, a straight relationship or is that uh, something that might be overstated? I think there, there's quite a straight uh, relationship. If you add more food, you have more organisms. Again, like not necessarily always diversity, but they will be more abundant. And the abundance biomass of a system can be much more meaningful than diversity. Like if you think of ocean systems, like you have a blue whale uh, and you have krill, they are just, I think it's one species or a few. And just the biomass is just so enormous that you can see from space. If you see these pictures, it's, it's, it's great. Um, that's what you learn with small kids. You, so you see this documentary, so it's not my field, but, biomass can be much more meaningful and that is enormously increased by adding manure for example and not well if you have too many nutrients you actually decrease your species richness so you you need well it's also like if you go to to uh, vegetation systems if you go to a peatland to a uh, heather system to alpine regions it's super diverse but the biomass is quite low right 
And yeah, that's what we also see. Monocultures where we put a lot of stuff in, they have a lot of yields. While yeah, cultures with a lot of plants um, often don't have that much biomass, but more species rich. So yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. So in terms of organic matter, you increase your biomass. A, a good few uh, queries about uh, the possibilities for testing and, and wondering, is there possibilities in the DNA space for assessing soil health by, by looking at the diversity of, of, uh, um, of material or DNA material that's, that's within soils? Exactly, that's what we are doing a lot now. There's a huge potential because with that, you get a resolution to yeah, something like a species. You don't know because species are not defined in these organisms often, but you get a very high resolution. And that's what we actually, all these studies with diversity richness are based on uh, sequencing techniques. And because, yeah, th that's much more sensitive than just PLFA or so uh, based on phospholipids, cellular components or uh, copy numbers of a gene. Um, because that is just, okay, it gives you abundance, it gives you a bit of biomass information of some groups, but with uh, molecular sequencing techniques, you get information of community structure, so the abundance of organisms roughly, and uh, all these organisms at the same time, their composition, because sometimes the ratio of good versus bad can be more informative than, yeah, the biomass or so. So for me, that's the way forward for sure. Okay, uh, another question in there with the, the emphasis on, uh, I suppose to call it uh, carbon farming and, and, and the potential for sequestering uh, uh, additional carbon in, into the soils. Do you see the uh, uh, any potential ways that we could improve that sequestration through the management of the of the biome? Uh, and it, I suppose what, what prospect is there for, for improving our performance in that in that respect as a soil function? That's a very good one. So we are we are we are starting to work on this. One PhD student of mine, um, because yeah, obviously when you put in more, you get you, you release more, right? But what you actually want it to be sequestered, to want it to become a bit more stable, not super stable, because then you could put car tires in the soil. But that's also not you what, what you want. But you want something that is stable over month or few years that is slowly released and available then. And how that is, well, you guys need to teach me that. So we are, we are, we are trying to get into this, also see the role of these uh, microbial predators, because we see on the short run, they increase carbon release, they increase litter decomposition. So they increase mass loss which is not directly what you want, but they make it also available, right? And we don't know if they stabilize maybe something of, yeah, of the carbon pool in soil. So that's not just all released as CO2, but that something is more sequestered. And that, yeah, but, but I can't answer this one. It okay. would be really, really important to know, but if, if it's easy to know, then it would be done. Okay, question there in relation to plant breeding and our focus on plant breeding has predominantly, I suppose, focused around breeding uh, uh, plants that can uptake nitrogen that's available in, uh, I suppose, from a chemical fertilizer and deliver uh, uh, plant material from it. But do we need to look at a, an integration or an interaction between uh, what we're trying to achieve on, uh, in terms of soil health and what we're trying to achieve through soil arts, through plant breeding to try and optimize our, our outcomes. Absolutely. There's not just one way, like, like just add some soil microbiome predators will change the world. I don't believe in this. Well, would be a dream for me and so on, but it's, it's not that easy. So I think we need to work together in a multidisciplinary way. Breeding, for sure. We are now testing also, like, if we mix some genotypes in a field, what it does to a soil, what the soil does to it in the long run, like in the next generation and so on. So, for sure, this is needed. We need to work together with, yeah, plant breeders, with also, well, fertilizer companies, with everyone. There's quite a few questions coming in around that carbon nitrogen balance or ratio um, in terms of assessing your soil health or soil 
biology, our potential for biology. Um, how how does that work, Stefan? Are there practical measurements for that, or how how can one assess that within their soil? Yeah, well, if if we were there, then I would have a big market. Um, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, I have some kind of ethics. I, I, I wanna wanna don't want to make big money with it. But um, yeah, we are we are try we are working on this as well to optimize it because yeah, at least from from farmers we heard it's just too expensive to get us some kind of information about pH whatsoever. They have to pay I don't know 150 200 euros every year because it's forced. Um, and that's for nothing, honestly. Well, of course, you get some information about your, your available nitrogen and so on, but often, yeah, farmers know this already without even doing these things. So that doesn't tell you too much about soil health in an integrated way. It tells you, okay, there's nutrients available or not. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's at least what I heard from, from these end users. And I think we could optimize this. And well, we are trying, so that you need hundreds, thousands of samples to really understand the system, to really understand, well, what a proper indicator is, for example, for nutrient status, but you want more from also DNA-based stuff because, yeah, then it, yeah, it's too expensive just to get information on pH or so. So you want an integrative measure, ideally. And I see the potential, but it's not there yet. So we are actually trying or oh, writing some proposals to get funding for this. Um, yeah, not a perfect answer, sorry, but no, no, yeah. no, no, no. It's, it's good to know. You, you, well, it was mentioned at the beginning of the impending soil legislation. Mm -hmm. Well, with the number of questions you you posed here today, do we know enough to put in really effective soil legislation? That's always a good one, right? So, like scientists are always a bit critical. We always say, oh, we need more research, da da da. But you need to start somewhere. So I see the importance of starting somewhere where whatever this is, and we, we know enough to start somewhere. So it's not just without any knowledge. So I, th I think we have a good basis to start. But then it, they should be optimized. They should not be set for the next 20 years because there's such huge development. These, well, every week there are new studies that can help. So no, it should be done. Yeah, well, I think, look, there's some low-hanging fruit around soil preservation and uh, even the, the erosion prevention and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's I'd imagine that's probably the direction that some of that legislation would be heading. Uh, we're just coming up on half past uh, 10, uh, Stefan. Uh, Pat, did you have any burning questions? That no, you I think I covered most think of the we've questions. We've covered pretty <laughs> much everything there. And uh, look, there's some really good suggestions and lots of compliments coming through, Stefan on your Thanks. presentation and really people appreciating the, f the fact that we're, we're shining a light on this whole area. And uh, look, it's, I, I think we're going to have to do, do far more in this space. And uh, we have those good work going on in Chagask in this area with our colleagues in Johnstown Castle. And uh, I did share a link to everybody with uh, of, of the boards and the videos from that uh, event that took place on the 16th of March uh, down in Johnstown Castle. Lots of really informative uh, slides and videos there if you want to find out a little bit more about what's going on there so for now stefan stefan thank you so much for your presentation and uh pat thanks very much for for helping out with the questions and uh our thanks to uh yvonne maher and andy boland uh, on the production team thanks yvonne for helping out in the background today and uh next week we're going to be uh hearing getting an update on the farm uh, zero c uh project and Gavin Hunt and Alexandra Vergara uh, is, are going to be joining from uh, Biorbic and UCD, respectively. So uh, do join us next Friday for, for that uh, another interesting uh, presentation. So until then, enjoy the fine weather, and um, hopefully a little bit of rain will come in the meantime, and uh, we, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. And thanks for the interaction and questions.